McNamara to start his presentation. As he's getting his slides together, I'm very pleased to say he's Professor of Management and Head of the School of Business here. Peter has exceptional academic credentials and has been teaching all over the world and has published in top international journals around the whole aspect of organizations and management. So over to you, Peter. Thanks so much, John, uh, for the time. I super appreciate it. And in particular to uh, the guidance counselors and principals that are here today. Look, the, the only reason why we have a university at all is because of your students and because of the hard work that you do in directing students to the places that are right for them. So just wanna say thanks uh, very much. We, we really, really do appreciate that. I want to talk about two degrees here today, the BBA uh, Business and Languages, MH409, and the new member of the MH404 family, uh, the BBS Business and Global Cultures. From my perspective, these are just two vital degrees that for the last seven years really, really wanted to have them on board because the present and the future uh, of business is really its ability to work linguistically uh, and to understand, adapt and integrate with other cultures. So I'm going to take you through really why these degrees are important and briefly review uh, what they are from a business perspective. So look, don't worry about the details here. They're all available on the prospectus. So uh, I don't expect that you'd see all this, but uh, the uh, business administrator, uh, the BBA uh, business and languages, essentially what a student would be doing is they'd be choosing two 30 credit blocks. They would take 30 credits of a business subject, 30 credits of a language subject. The business subjects that they could take is business and management. Now, business and management is really our widest choice subject in that you get a foundation of, a, of everything really, of core marketing, core management, core operations, accounting, uh, strategy, human resource management, etc. So it really gives the student a really wide uh, base of understanding. It's also the one that you would take if you were thinking about uh, subsequently going on to be a teacher. Um, international business really, uh, again, it gives you that core. Every degree gives you the core, but there's a bit more surrounding how multinationals work, how you trade internationally, how you manage diverse cultures and teams. Marketing is really all about, and John McGinley is uh, uh, the best example of this that I know, how do you analyze markets? How do you work out um, where there might be an interest in the products and services that you got or what products and services you might want? And then how do you sell those? And accounting is really the language of business. A accounting is about trying to work out how do we account for our revenue? How do we account for our costs? And how do we manage our costs so that we get the, the right amount of energy into the places that are needed most? Uh, now, accounting can only at present be combined with German and Spanish. Uh, all other businesses can be combined with Chinese, French, German, and Spanish. In the third year, students get to do a study abroad. And I think it's so important for developing their linguistic skills, but also developing their independence. And fundamentally getting them an appreciation of so what is it like to live and and work or reside in another culture and and how are cultures subtly different in the way they do business now i believe in this so much that i'm off to germany on wednesday with my daughter to take her to Idarobishtim where she's doing her one year study abroad uh, in germany because i just think it's a really foundational part of any education experience and then they come back to Munich and they do their final year uh, normal entry requirements. The language isn't a requirement, but it is recommended, um, but not required. Uh, and then the BBS, uh, Business and Global Cultures, that's a three-year degree. Uh, you choose one business subject from a choice of three. It's part of the core MH404 family. Uh, so that would be business and management, international business, or marketing. You combine that with global cultures, and David will talk more about that from my perspective. Global cultures is really about fundamentally understanding how to analyze and interpret other cultures and to think how we could work with people from other cultures and how we can deliver solutions to other cultures and how other cultures can deliver solutions to us in a connected way. You can, of course, change if you want at the end of year two, as with all other MH404 degrees, uh, into a four-year degree where you do a paid work placement and then come back. And that's something I, as a student, took myself and, and I got great benefit from that. You don't need a third language uh, for MH404. 
Uh, so in terms of the business community here, we're all about the students. Like, look at those wonderful people on their graduation day. There's nothing happier. And being in the classroom, it's just going to be great to have them all back uh, next week physically. That's what we're about. We're from 19 different uh, nationalities and there are some of the pictures of our team uh, and we've got uh, industry partners some of the places that our students have gone on to work with that you can see there our fundamental mission is to develop critical thinkers so we're trying to provide students with the fundamental knowledge of each of the four different uh, business uh, subjects depending on what they choose and then the ability to decide how to vary them a critical thinker doesn't mean objecting to everything a critical thinker is much like being a chef when you start out learning cooking, you learn the basics of taste, you follow recipes. But as you become more experienced, you learn how different tastes may go together, how in different kitchens might, might have different uh, utensils and therefore I have to adapt. That's a critical thinker. A chef is a critical thinker and a business person needs to be a critical thinker as well. The fundamental tools I have, how do I deploy them? Uh, and uh, providing impactful knowledge for society. We've got five values. We're liberal. We fundamentally believe that the problems of the world are not solved by one hero individual, but by a coming together of people from different disciplines and different backgrounds to solve the problems of society. And hence, having business and languages going together, having cultures and business going together, that's what we're all about. We're egalitarian. We want your students, irrespective of their capability. There's a home for them here. We believe in taking students and going on a shared journey with them and improving themselves to be the best that they can be. We're not an elitist place, we're an egalitarian place. We're research informed. Uh, we're in the top 20% of uh, business schools in the world in terms of research impact, which is kind of cool. Uh, and we're practice engaged. We're very much about providing them relevant skills for industry so that they can have a sustainable uh, career. Our present and future is about creating value for the world. So it's really important in an Irish business uh, that you're trying to create value for the wider world. We're a tiny country. So we're all about that connectivity with the wider world. And these degrees fill a key gap in the Irish education market. The range of choice of combinations of business and language and cultures is unrivaled in Maynooth relative to any other university in Ireland. The key features there, uh, the widest range of choice, but I might say, if you look at the picture in the top right hand side there and you see pit potential and you see those students going by. That picture was actually created by one of our building services people who went around and asked students, what does the Maynooth community mean the most for you? And he put this up on the walls and creating their potential, realizing their dreams is what we're about here in Maynooth, be you in campus services or be you a staff member. So it's the widest range of choice. And in the first four weeks of first year, you can change uh, within subjects of MH409. So you can change the four business subjects, you can change the four uh, languages until you find what works for you. Uh, broadly speaking, there are some constraints in that. And then in MH404, similarly, you can change the different kinds of business combinations. So we enable people to have choice and, and, and to learn and grow themselves in the first four weeks of first year. We have an international faculty from 19 uh, countries. It's a very diverse community. We've got a living lab that we've been rolling out for the last few years. So this is about saying that at least half of all the modules that we teach will involve working on live industry projects, building skills that are relevant for a career so that they can see how you use these things in reality, bringing in industry speakers from outside, getting our students uh, to work with industry partners, getting them to solve uh, real problems. And teaching as a career as possible uh, by choosing business and management as a subject in either MH404 or uh, 409 with cultures or, or languages. Uh, and it's also possible to be an accounting teacher in MH409. The differences between the degrees, I think I've, I've gone through that quite a bit. Essentially, one's a four-year degree uh, with four business choices and four languages uh, and a study abroad. MH404 is a three-year degree with three business choices and culture, but you can convert it into a four-year degree and do a study abroad or do a paid work placement if a student wishes. Um, and either way, you're going to be there on the graduation and thank God we'll be returning to physical graduations uh, soon. So our economy and the globe is uh, in the globe is changing. 
Business languages and cultures are creating resilience. That's the key thing that our students need. They need resilience. There's been stability for 40 years in the European Union where we've been ever expanding, but Britain is gone now. There's uncertainties there. We've had a strong partnership with the United States, but there have been changes there. The economy is uncertain. Asia is moving in a different direction. And so we need to adapt as Irish people have in the last 50 years. And that adaption is building our business capacity, our language and our cultural adaptability. We need to connect. Income is created by connecting with markets outside of Ireland and by creating and capturing values for creating products for uh, others in the uh, global economy. So being part of global production systems. If you look at Intel, it's down in leak slip and David was a leader there. Um, you know, it's producing chips, but those chips are going into cars and into mobile phones and other technologies right across the world. And that Intel plant is part of a global production system. You're working in a global management system with people from different cultures and languages. Global supply chains, products and services coming into Ireland, being transformed and going back out. We need to work out that. And we need to work out the resilience of supply chains. You know, one of the big problems right now is shortage of container uh, shipping capacity. It's increased tenfold in cost. That's one of the things that you're thought in this course. How do you deal with the response to sudden shocks in global supply chains? Service systems. Services are no longer provided at the point of care. They're provided, there's a whole lot of back office things that support the person who might be in a face-to-face -face service environment. And many of the services, online shopping, et cetera, are provided in distributed systems. And of course, your innovation systems, which is the most important thing. How do we create new value? You need to be part of that global innovation system. We are very small in Ireland, and sometimes we forget that. Look at this pictogram. I can hardly see Ireland. It's up there somewhere uh, over by the slightly bigger looking Britain. It's tiny. The wealth that we have is in no way connected with our size. If our economy was the size of this tiny map, we would be a very poor country. But the reality is that our GDP is really large. I mean, it should be really small, but you see that green? It's in the over... 500 billion, the, the, you know, the, the 100 billion to 500 billion, that's a phenomenal for a 5 million country. It's a phenomenal outcome. And the GDP in this country is in the top 10 per capita in the world. Now, even if you strip away some of the economics, just go and look outside, look at the amount of cars that are outside, look at what's available in the shops. This is a very wealthy society and it's wealthy because of its ability to connect with others to serve others in the world. If it didn't connect with others and didn't serve with others, it would lose that. And the recent disruptions in our economy mean that we need to adapt with more languages and culture. The core problem our stu students are facing is making a living in this new world. Brexit is a canary in the mind of fundamental change. It's about culture before economics. Yes, there are economic consequences to Brexit, but Brexit, many of my family live in Britain. It's a cultural phenomena that had economic consequences. And that cultural desire to disconnect from the rest of the world and to be independent is something that's present in other parts of the world and that ebbs and flows over time. And our students need to adapt to that world now to work out how we can continue to prosper in that changing world. Those cultural changes and those dramatic shifts are understood well when you take the global cultures course, but also when you absorb yourself in a culture. As migration patterns change, global connectivity grows and declines and skills need to adapt. In the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s, Irish people left. We all had an uncle and cousin in somewhere else. And a lot of our global connectivity was by those familial connections. Today in the estate where I am, I just have to go to my neighbor, Polish, I have to go to another neighbor, Brazilian, down the road, South African. The world has come into Ireland, which is a wonderful thing. And we need to absorb those new cultural connections to create new wealth uh, for the future. Our students need to have sophisticated and flexible cultural uh, skills. You can see we're productive in the world, but actually that's not, uh, when you look at this, this is the wealth increases in the world. You can see the English speaking word in yellow is amongst the riches in the world. But the fastest growing are the Chinese speaking parts of the world, the Japanese, uh, sorry, the uh, Spanish speaking uh, parts of the world and the German speaking parts of the world, which is why we've included those languages there. 
our productivity in terms of GDP, you can see we're over on the far right hand side. We're the richest country in the world in 2011 from this data study. Now, it varies from piece to piece, but you can see that in terms of the number of hours we work, we don't work very much relative to other parts of the world. Our wealth is therefore corrected, created by our ability to connect with others, and we must never lose sight of that. Others work much harder than us. Uh, we just have worked out how to work in a more connected way. The power of languages, you can see here, and, and Valerie would know much more about this than I. English is a very powerful language, yes, in terms of economy and the number of people that speak it as a second language in the world. But Chinese, Mandarin is the second strongest in terms of an economy and number of uh, first and second speakers. And Spanish is the third uh, biggest communicative. So the languages we we're offering here are because of the depth of their economic power and their communication capability. And also it's worth pointing out that 79% of people prefer to purchase in their own language and to work in their own language. So having a knowledge of somebody else's language is very valuable. The business subjects that we offered, I already talked about those a bit. Business and management, it's about organization. It's about how to work with and through people to get things done for customers. And it, it gives you a profound understanding of all the functions of business. Marketing is about the exchange of value. It's about analyzing markets, stimulating customer interests and selling. And international business is about globalization, organizing global production teams, supply chains and markets. Accounting is the language of business. It's about all these explanations of business development, investment, et cetera. But never forget that accounting is actually a cultural construct. Two accountants, same training, can give two different profit numbers depending upon their linguistic and their cultural perspectives, which is why culture is important there. The takeaway is that really to grow and survive and be resilient, employers need staff with business and language skills, with business and cultural analytic skills. And these degrees build those skills that are needed today amongst employers and tomorrow. So I really hope that you might encourage your students to seriously think about these degrees and take away that when you're giving them this opportunity, you're giving them choice as well. They don't have to settle on day one on one. They have the first few weeks of first year to, to chop and change and decide which languages, which uh, business works for them. So there's that choice and flexibility as well. Thank you so much. Uh, for your time and, and thank you for uh, being part of the wider Maynooth community. Thank you. Peter, that, that's lovely. And thank you very much for um, fronting us up on this particular program. I'm, I'm kind of interested in the whole aspect of Brexit and it hasn't gone away, absolutely. And each time I look at the news, there is a new development in Brexit. And even on this island, I think it's still a lot to play out. So culturally, you can sense the whole aspect of interwoven culture and and how some parties were very interested in Brexit and some weren't so even on this island. So it, it, as you say, culture probably trumps economics, although Tavana will have a word about that later on. Uh, Kay, you had mentioned there might be one or two questions. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, some of the uh, participants would like, number one, to know the places available for the from the QQI applicants yeah. and the cutoff, and also would like um, it to be addressed whether this will fulfill teaching council requirements. Sure. So the QQI piece, we have built that into the program. Uh, so people, there's five places on the MH409 and we've plenty 20 places on the MH404. In terms of teaching credentials, as long as people are doing the credits, we recommend business management for teaching of business more so than marketing or international develop, uh, international business. And then the aspect of languages, Absolutely, I know Professor Valerie Heffernan will be discussing this now shortly, but obviously if you're doing the credits in language, and we might come back to that afterwards, but absolutely there is a teaching part there, but one would have to then go on to enter the PME, the two-year PME that we have here, like we have 150 places every year, uh, but people would do the first degree and then do the, the PME afterwards. Okay, we, we might move on to Professor Heffernan, but take any questions then after that, if that's okay. Yes, um, absolutely. So just introduce Professor Heffernan, who is Professor of Literary, Literary and Cultural Studies here and Head of Middle University School of Modern Languages, Literatures and Cultures. Uh, Valerie has prestigious awards from uh, Mexico, Germany, uh, the Royal Irish Academy, uh, the Irish Research Council, and has taught significantly in various domains all over the world. 
I, I suppose I'm particularly interested in her area of research, which is in encompassing feminist theory, cultural studies, and literary studies. And her current work critically explores how motherhood is represented in contemporary literature and culture, a fascinating area. But over to you, Valerie, in terms of the languages component of the new degree in business and languages. Great, thanks for that, John. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Great, thank you. Um, okay, first of all, thank you all very much for giving of your time today. We're um, very appreciative of the time and energy you're giving to this, and we hope that you'll find lots of information, lots of interesting material here to share with your students. So I'm going to focus today, I'm going to follow on from what Peter said, um, introducing the business side of this BBA, Business and Languages degree, to talk more about the language side of things. So just to give um, a brief introduction, I want to talk about a, a graduate market survey that took place in this year, it's carried out by um, AHECS, -H -H -E the Association of Higher Education Career Services, amongst 302 graduate employers. And they were local, national and global companies, uh, multinationals and SMEs covering all sectors and disciplines. Um, they, the, 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 the survey was to find graduate recruitment trends. And one of the questions that they were asked was what, what foreign languages do you require in your organization? Interestingly, given this degree program, 18% of those employers said that they require French, 18% said they require German, 14% Spanish, 9% Chinese, 8% Italian and 6% Dutch. Dutch is actually mentioned in the course of this presentation as well, but those first, those top four languages that are needed by employers are represented in this new degree program. So what does this actually entail and what's, what do students need if they want to come into this program? So in first year, we have two streams. We have a, a, a stream of students coming from the leading cert, and we have a stream of students coming who are absolute beginners in the languages. So if someone has taken a language to leaving cert, we would generally recommend that they would have a H4, but that's not a hard and fast rule. We take into account all different kinds of profiles. And so this is more of a recommendation than a, 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 an absolute requirement. And if a student has less than that, they can certainly come and talk to us because it often happens, for example, that someone spent a, a time living in a country post leaving certificate. The, the, the uh, leaving certificate result might not necessarily uh, give a good picture of their competence. So this is a, a recommendation, but not a requirement. Um, in this case, if they're coming from leaving certificate, they would usually take 15 ECTS of language in the first year program. Um, and then alongside that, because the, the business takes up 30 credits of their 60 credits in first year, so they have 15 credits left over. There are a few different options that they can take to fill that other 15 credits. They can take another post leaving certificate language. So if someone has taken, for example, French and German to leaving certificate, they would have the option of taking two languages in first year and then make a decision at the end of first year which language they want to continue with to degree level. They could take 15 credits in a new language and culture um, extreme that we're introducing in first year from next year. Um, that is currently undergoing approval um, with our academic programs committee, but I can answer questions about it at the end if anyone wants to know more about it. Or they can take an extra uh, 15 ECTS of business. But this is the stream for someone coming from leaving certificate, wanting to continue with their language. So already with perhaps an intermediate level of language and wanting to continue at that level. Um, we also have a beginner's stream in French, German, Spanish and Chinese. So it is possible for someone to take up any one of those four languages as an absolute beginner in first year. And in that case, they need no prior knowledge or experience of the language. And they would take the full 30 credits of language. They get an intensive program in language in first year. And our aim is to bring them up to a, a similar standard at the end of first year uh, to those who are coming from leaving certificate. It's an ambitious goal. Usually, it, being honest, it happens in the course of second year, probably about halfway through second year, that they are really catching up with um, their uh, fellow students who are coming from leaving certificate. But it is they get a very, very intensive program, which uh, has a huge focus on language in the first year to try to bring them up in a very, at a very fast pace uh, to a, a leaving certificate standard. 
And that program has been very successful in the languages that it has been running in for, for a number of years now, because we tend to get very motivated students who perhaps didn't have an opportunity to study that language in school and are very, very interested in taking it up now. OK, so what does first year look like? Well, we have a very strong focus on small group teaching, and this works very well, both from the point of view of language learning. Um, it's always best with language learning to have a small group with lots of interaction and opportunity to, to, to work with, with a, a tutor continuously, to work with a small group that they become very familiar with and very confident with. Um, and it, we also find that the students really appreciate that in terms of easing the transition from secondary school to university. University can be an overwhelming ex experience for students when they first join us. And the focus on small group teaching in first year means that they're seeing the same group of usually around about 20 students um, on a continuous basis, two or three, four times a week. Um, and they, they become very familiar. They usually form their friend groups with that um, small group. Uh, we have a very, very strong focus in our first year on language skills, on both the active and on the passive language skills, so reading and writing, listening and speaking. Um, alongside that, there's a strong focus on cultural elements. Um, as Peter mentioned in the course of his presentation, culture is really crucial to language learning. It's, it's, it's not just about learning the words for something. It's about understanding those words in the broader cultural context. And so in first year, we bring those two things very closely together. Um, the cultural elements are integrated into the language teaching in first year. So everyone takes the same program in first year. If you're taking a beginner's um, language, you'll take 30 credits of that language, working mostly in small groups um, and focusing on language skills. But there's very little, I suppose, choice within that program. It, it's, it's everyone takes the same program. If you're taking a post leaving certificate language, everyone takes the same 15 credits and they're working again in small groups. It's really when you come into second year that there's more choice available. And that's when students can really begin to, to focus in on those areas that interest them most. So just to give you an example of the kinds of options that are available, everyone continues with language, obviously. Language is really crucial um, to the, 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 the programs. Uh, it, that, that it really forms the, the backbone of our programs the whole way up. So everyone has two core language modules every year. Um, and there's no um, optional op optionality in those language modules. Everyone has to take them, everyone has to pass them. But alongside those core language modules, there's a, a huge array, a variety of optional modules that students can take. So just to give you some idea, these are the options that are available to second year students in French. They can take uh, options in literature, in linguistics, in film, in culture. Here are the options in German studies. And as I mentioned, uh, you can actually take up Dutch for beginners. You can take Dutch for improvers. So there's two one semester courses in Dutch uh, for students who would like to take up another language in as part of that second year program. These are the options available to students taking second year Spanish. Again, options that involve literature, that involve syntax, that involve um, language studies, Latin American uh, literature and culture, Portuguese language and culture, Catalan language and culture. So uh, a huge amount of linguistic variety there, but also variety in terms of content. So every student is going to find something that will pique their interest. And then finally, these are the options that are available to second year students in Chinese studies. Again, um, television, film and new media, literature, um, social theory and uh, readings in gender, class, religion, and ethnicity. So students learn a lot in their second year, not just about language, but also about how to interpret, how to analyze, how to negotiate, and how to work in, in and with different cultures. And this really sets them up very well for their year abroad. And I want to come on to talk a little bit about the year abroad, which is an integral part of this new, D, new program, this MH409 Business and Languages degree program. The year abroad is, we consider it very, very important. It is the default position for all students studying languages that they would spend a full academic year abroad between their second year and their final year. We find this is really, really crucial in helping them to put into practice what they've been learning up until that point, to see how things work, to see how language can be used in, 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 in the everyday. And really it is about developing competence and developing confidence 
in their language skills, to taking what they've learned so far, putting into practice and developing that competence and co confidence on their year abroad. The main channel by which people get to and students get to spend a year abroad is through the Erasmus program with its uh, motto of enriching lives, opening minds. And we believe very, very strongly in this, that the, the experience of living in a different culture, a different country is hugely enriching to students. And it really is very, very important. The difference when students come back from their year abroad, honestly, the enthusiasm that they come back with, the uh, confidence that they come back with, not just in terms of their language skills, but also in terms of their personal development, it's hugely important as a, as a, a step along the way in a language program. But also I, I would argue that a year abroad should be a, an integral part of every degree program. It's so important in terms of uh, personal development and maturity. And so we have a lot of links uh, with universities in France, Germany and Spain. Students studying French obviously would go spend their year abroad in France, Germany, Spain for German studies and Spanish and Latin American studies. And for those students who are studying um, Chinese studies, we have uh, links with universities in Beijing and Shanghai. So they would go and spend their year abroad in China. Um, and so they spent two semesters studying abroad. Now, as Peter mentioned, we also have a placement option. I haven't it included in the slides. It's a, um, it, it, I suppose we're, we're a little hesitant about it because it does uh, involve um, uh, approval. Students will have to discuss this with their coordinator and ensure that it fits with the academic um, progress of the program. Uh, but that is also an option. And for those who are interested in teaching, we do have some existing placements already um, available in uh, France, Germany, and Spain. So we have some arrangements with schools in those countries, and we also can feed uh, students and help them prepare an application for uh, the English language assistant program that is offered by the Department of Education and Skills. And um, so that is a recognized Erasmus uh, internship uh, as, as part of the undergraduate program. Um, when they come back from their year abroad with all this confidence and this higher level knowledge and competence that I'm um, discussing here, they go into their final year. And once again, the core language modules are, you know, vital to the study of the languages. All students will take their two core language modules every year. And then alongside that, they will choose the options uh, that most interests them, that they are most confident that they will get good results in. In final year, we find students tend to be more focused on uh, the choosing modules that they know they're going to do well in. Obviously, they want to go out into the world with a, a strong degree. Um, and so they will um, choose the options um, based on their experience that they had in second year, their experience they had on the year abroad, because of course, they will have taken courses on the year abroad and um, based on what they think might uh, be of interest and of use to them beyond college. Um, these are the options that would be available to uh, students of German in final year. Um, so as you can see, for example, teaching German on a, as a foreign language is one of the options. Um, and uh, these are the options available to students in um, French studies options available to students in Spanish and Latin American studies. And again, you can see that methodologies for teaching Spanish as a foreign language coming up. And um, also there is uh, a Spanish literature and context teaching and learning. So understanding how to integrate literature into language teaching, for example. And these are the options available to final year students in Chinese studies. So a huge range and all students are going to find something there that is of interest to them. Um, at the end of the degree program, especially having spent their year abroad, we fully expect students to be very confident in their language skills. Um, it is usually the practice that many of the final year options are taught almost entirely through the medium of the target language. And we can do that in final year because students not only have the competency to allow for that, but they also have the interest in it. They are very motivated, having come back from their year abroad with strong language skills, they're keen to keep them up, they're keen to practice, they're keen to get involved, and they're keen to have as much content, content as possible uh, through the target language in final year. Um, I wanted to mention some of the employers that our graduates have gone on to employment with. And as you can see, these are some of the multinationals that are based in Ireland. Um, some of the companies, uh, the you know, big name companies, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, PayPal, and so on. These companies are crying out for our graduates with language skills. And I say this because they contact me regularly. Hardly a week would go by where I don't get a, an email from um, a recruiter or from a, a, a company who wants to speak to our students. And that's really 
um, becomes quite acute when it comes to sort of April, May of, of uh, the second semester when uh, the um, graduate recruiters are very keen to speak to our uh, final year students. Um, so there are lots and lots of options for students in Ireland. And of course, if they have a language, this opens up a whole range of possibilities for them outside of Ireland. So many of our students who have spent uh, their year abroad are very keen as soon as they graduate to head back to the country and to try to find employment in the country that they've lived in on their year abroad. Um, it opens up lots of opportunities for them with uh, in the EU, for example. Um, so um, I, I mean, I'm working for the European Commission as well. Um, so there are lots and lots of uh, opportunities for graduates with this degree. And uh, it is often the case as well that um, employers say to us that what they want is students with really, really strong, not just a smattering of, of the language, they want strong language skills, they want confident language skills. They want students uh, who feel just as well able to speak to the partners on the phone in German as in English, in French as in English, who can give a presentation in Spanish to the Spanish partner or to the, 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 the office, the Madrid office and so on. They want that kind of confidence in their skills and they, they want people with the business knowledge as well. So this combination of business and languages is very sought after in the marketplace um, at the moment. So just again, takeaways here. The students on MH409 will take the full degree program in their chosen language. Now that's very important because there are many um, business and languages programs in Ireland and other universities where students take a little bit of the language program and they don't necessarily have the full language program. They don't get that crucial cultural element, which is really important for them having a strong sense of the cultural side of language learning and a strong sense of the cultural community within which they will be working uh, when they graduate. Um, so students on MH409 take the full degree program, the same language program that any core language student will take and the full range of options available to them. They have a twin focus on language and culture throughout the degree program. Um, the integrated year abroad bolsters students' competence and their confidence in their knowledge of the target language and culture. And finally, MH409 will put students in a very strong position for employment in Ireland and abroad on graduation. I'm happy to answer any more questions that you might have. Thank you very much for your attention. Valerie, thank you very much. And it kind of follows on a theme from earlier on around the whole aspect of Brexit and the importance of language and the importance of and the opportunities that are arising uh, because of Brexit and because of the opportunities across Europe and across the world. And I think important you're talking about the symbiotic relationship between the language and also the literature and the culture and, and the sense that they are necessarily interwoven. But in this degree, stu students will, will have access to all of that uh, expertise here. Uh, Kay, I'm not sure if those one or two questions um, or comments? Uh, yep. Nothing has been said there. I would just say to the audience, the way the webinar is set up, we would very much welcome you to type in your questions. Um, because uh, while I can see people are uh, raising your hands, you don't have a facility to speak at the way the webinar is set up, because it can be, you know, we can take up to 500 attendees. So if anybody has any questions, please type them in and we can relate them verbally to John and Professor Heffernan if required. Um, can I just say, has my screen frozen there? Uh, I can't actually unshare, uh, I can't stop sharing. Have you? Um... We okay. Can that in the back I'll just try and share my screen. Sorry, it's too okay. dry. You might be able to override me. If not, yeah. I will leave the meeting. I'm just going to have Tavana's uh, video just here. That's a prep. Let's see. Can we see that? Yeah. Yes. yes. Perfect. There we go. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you, Deirdre. And Valerie, just to mention, I think just to, to say to colleagues and the guidance return to just the whole aspect that this is a separate denominated degree, MH409, which does have a whole range of things like the QQI routes that's so important, um, mature entry. Uh, and then also one of the things that's been approved here is the, the possibility of a transfer from MH101 Arts, whereby somebody may have applied and, and in terms of what their ambition is to get into MH409, but they may have strategically as a backup in their CEO MH101 in whereby they will be doing business and a language or two languages in first year. And then the possibility when you pass first year to get into second year. And there's no caps on that progression as part of our flexible uh, Minute University curriculum. Um, 
I'll just and, move on, but if Valerie, great if you can stay because we may have some questions later on and Peter, uh, but I'll move on now, if I may, to the, the second part of it, which is the, the global cultures degree streams. And just to mention colleagues on that, what this is, is additional streams within an existing degree. The existing degree is MH404, business, marketing and international business. And as Professor uh, Prendergast will now explain, there's the possibility of taking each of those with, with global cultures. Just a little bit of his biography, uh, Professor Prendergast is Professor in Science, Technology and Society at the Department of Anthropology here, uh, is fascinated with his research in terms of midlife and later life transitions and has worked as uh, Professor McMara said earlier on in Intel, working the whole aspect of research and service innovation and in terms of later life and later life transitions. We're joined also on the panel colleagues by Professor Hanna Servankova, who is head of the Department of Anthropology. And in fact, this degree is the brainchild of a triumvirate of Professor Servankova, Professor Prendergast and Professor McNamara, who together uh, conceived this particular degree and we're excited about it. And uh, over to you, Professor Prendergast, to explain it to us. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, super, well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you today about the new Business and Global Cultures Programme beginning in September, 2022. Um, as Peter mentioned earlier, the BBS Business and Global Cultures uh, is a three-year degree that can be converted to a Bachelor of Business Administration with the addition of, um, <coughs> me, of, of a study abroad year or a paid placement. In terms of balance, uh, 30 credits a year will be spent uh, studying global cultures uh, modules and the other 30 credits per year on the business management marketing <coughs> or international business streams. Uh, entry requirements are 2H5 and 406 or H7. Uh, Irish and English should be at least 06H7 and maths 04H7. And there's no third language requirement. So why this um, BBS program in business and global cultures? Well, businesses in Ireland need to be able to develop and adapt product services and solutions to meet the needs of diverse and changing markets that are largely outside our island. Our graduates also increasingly work uh, in multicultural teams and organisations. And why now? Well, the image to the right of this slide is mainly for illustrative purposes, but it is a page from a section of Ireland's National Skills Strategy 2025 that points to the growing importance of management leadership business planning skills, international marketing and selling skills, foreign language capabilities and cultural awareness. It points to the rising needs for such skills uh, as a result of the influence of global trends such as technological change, uh, changing consumption patterns, new ways of working, global value networks, shifting power structures, urbanization and pressures on resources. All these topics are key themes explored within this novel degree program. Students on the MH404 Business with Options CAO code will combine their chosen business field with an array of global cultures modules delivered by Ireland's only Department of Anthropology. These programs are designed for both secondary students who have no prior knowledge of business or social science, and also for those with prior experience. Peter has already outlined the business components of the degree streams in some detail. So it's sufficient here to note, it, to note that the business focus um, moves from providing students with foundational concepts and skills in the first year uh, to core functional capabilities and field depth in the second and strategic perspective in, the, in, the, in their final year. On the global culture side of the programme, we focus on the interconnectedness of the local and the global to understand the transnational flows and mobilities of culture, ideas, media, technology, and finance that impact people's lives across the world. We are fortunate to have a very experienced uh, department whose staff have lived, worked, and conducted research in 25 countries in Europe, Asia, Africa, the Pacific Islands, and the Americas. The image here is a collage of some of the recent books that we have produced in the department. For example, the image here on the left uh, is, a, is a cover of a 2018 book by Mike 
uh, colleague, Paul, uh, Dr. Pauline Garvey, who will be teaching on the programme, about her study of IKEA consumption and the at, at the at times frantic popularity of this iconic transnational store. Pauline explores why IKEA is never just a store uh, for its customers and questions why it is described in terms of cultural package as everyday and classless. Situated in Sweden and Ireland, her ethnography follows the furniture from the IKEA stores outwards to probe what people actually take home with them, how they're used, circulation, and what are the implications for business and design. A key objective of the Global Cultures Programme is to foster understanding of how global changes impact local, regional, national, and supranational biz business and social practices, policies, and markets, and vice versa. Students will learn how to analyze concrete situations and issues in the world around them in order to define and communicate human needs and develop people-centered solutions. Modules will empower students with practical competences and skills of practice linked ethnographic and social science research. And it features subjects that develop cross-cultural awareness and build observational critical thinking and multidisciplinary problem solving skills. So the blue uh, modules in this slide are compulsory and the green um, uh, modules represent a sample of some of the optional topics of study that we offer to business and global culture students. In the first year, students will take 30 uh, global cultures credits to develop intercultural uh, skills through an understanding of human diversity and difference. In addition to core modules teaching the foundations of anthropology, exploring cultures in global contexts, students will study modules in science and technology and society, as well as how people create their own worlds through objects, online interactions, and visual media. In the second year, global cultural students will learn how to systematically observe, interpret, and describe the world around them. Module topics will include sustainability, consumption and identity, anti-racism, ethnographic research methods, area studies and global health. In their final year, students will develop and apply both creative and critical thinking skills in, um, in our compulsory user experience and service innovation and global processes modules. A wide range of optional uh, uh, modules exist in subjects such as in environmental or forensic anthropology, security, crime and policing, and visual communication and media. Students have the option of converting from the BBS to the BBA at the end of their second year, thus enabling them to choose between a cultural and linguistic experience in an overseas, uh, overseas third level institution or a paid work placement in an organization that is multicultural in orientation and business practices. For example, an export orientated services or product business uh, or an international organization or a firm with a multicultural workforce. This is important for students to acquire an appreciation of the lived experience of living in and working in or with another culture. This will stand students uh, when they later work in business, businesses that involve trade with customers or coordination with suppliers and colleagues across cultural and linguistic boundaries. So why should students choose this degree? Well, this is a, a unique degree in Ireland, enabling students to combine three business subjects with insights into how culture impacts on the choices that people make and how they live. It combines practical business skills from Ireland's youngest and most dynamic school of business and intercultural uh, competences from uh, the only anthropology department in the Republic of Ireland. It's a three year uh, BBS degree that can lead to a BBA if students choose this option of an additional year uh, on paid work placement or study abroad enabling students to apply theory and practice and significantly improving employability upon graduation. As staff are a blend of international and local industry experts and academics who bring profound insights into the practicality and complexity of both business and global cultures. 
it also um, creates a highly employable skill set. And there's a, it provides an, an, a combination of excellent skills in both business and global cultures, uh, which uh, means you are highly employable in all sectors of business, both private and the public sectors. So I myself works for 12 years at Intel, uh, first as a social science and design lead um, for, the, for, in, uh, for, the, for its digital health group, and then later directing user experience research teams uh, into sustainable uh, and smart cities and the Internet of Things. In, uh, and I worked um, in creating living labs in London and San Jose and Dublin. So the value of industry um, for industry of skill combinations and subjects such as business, science, design, engineering uh, and anthropology is very familiar to me. The business and cultural awareness skill mix that we are launching in this degree is highly sought after in both industry and the public sector. I discussed this with Yvonne Highland, Managing Vice President uh, at Gardner, uh, which is a, a world leading research and business advisory company. And she was very enthusiastic about the degree, stating that successful businesses are much more than just a collection of products, services, operational procedures and financial numbers. Uh, successful businesses have a purpose driven uh, focus and strive for trust based long term relationships between their organizations globally <laughs> um, and business partner, uh, partner organizations globally. The need to understand cultural impacts of business decisions is critical for success. In terms of the public sector, several years ago, the Scottish government committed itself to better understanding the needs of its citizens and a transdisciplinary approach to developing solutions to complex problems. Uh, and their approach uh, you know, in includes embedding ethnography, design, business, iterative user research into all its development processes. And this is overseen and managed by Chief Design Officer, um, Dr. Katrina McCauley, who, uh, when I was discussing this degree with her, uh, stated that a crucial skill we all face in government and in society is learning how to think about and understand really complex problems, learning how to look at each other's lives and situations engage with them and then bring those insights back to work on thinking about how to change something or solve a problem. The list of careers that can benefit from understanding uh, of business and cultural context is very, very lengthy. I think we've already kind of seen a lot of that in the previous presentations. But this would include things such as working or managing within a, a multinational or globally distributed teams, uh, sales and marketing in international and multicultural settings, human resources where one is making decisions about hiring and managing in a multicultural context, uh, entrepreneurship and public service innovation, uh, user experience, participatory design and ecosystem research and development, to name just a few. Um, I think before I finish, one additional thing to note is that from 2023, a pathway will exist for students in MH101 Arts who've completed the first year business and some of the anthropology modules to move into this programme. Uh, I think John McGinnity was able to give more, more information on this. So thank you very much for listening to this overview on the forthcoming BBS, BBA Business and Global Cultures programme. Uh, and I'd be very pleased to discuss this further with any of you um, who'd like uh, additional detail in the future. Thank you. David, thank you very much for that. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to our other panel members. Uh, I know there's been a significant number of questions coming in on languages and language, language acquisitions. So Valerie, thank you for answering them. So, so colleagues, just please know we're here to answer your questions this afternoon. So if you have any questions at all, please put them into the chat because that's why we're here. Um, I'm not sure, Kay, is there any particular questions uh, on the global cultures uh, degree streams because Professor Servankova and Professor Prendikas can take them here. You might be muted there, Kay. I beg your pardon. Classic, isn't it? Um, yeah. so, so I know, uh, Valerie, you've been very, very busy answering queries and questions here. If you could just briefly mention for people who arrived, arrived a little bit after your um, comment on P, uh, the QQI places from the PLC sure. colleges, if you could just briefly address that for a moment. And yeah. I think, uh, Valerie, there was one there that you actually wished to answer live, if you want to go ahead with that when you have a moment. Over to you, Valerie. 
Yeah, I hit the wrong button to be perfectly honest, but I oh, that's all right. anyway. <laughs> um, so Anne Mannion had asked um, if she could check uh, whether MU provides additional language choices, Polish, Ru Russian, etc. We don't provide Polish and Russian. Um, there are options to take other languages in the course of the degree as options. So as I mentioned, um, you can, as a student of German, take Dutch as part of the degree program. As a, a student of uh, Spanish, you can take Portuguese and Catalan as part of the um, degree program, uh, but we don't provide uh, a degree program in Polish or Russian at the moment. I hope that answers the question. That, that's Certainly. great, Valerie. And, There's uh, uh, one in yep. there that if you had time to briefly mention how the paid work placement actually would function. I think that was for David, was it? Was um, that for David? Yeah. Apologies. Thank you. Yes, uh, we're still working on this, uh, but we've been discussing this with our placements office. So it will operate uh, in, uh, alongside that, uh, although we will be spending time and Peter will have something to say on this as well. Um, developing uh, a series of relationships. We already have, it, we already have a, a series of relationships with various businesses and we'll be kind of uh, develop those together. Uh, the placement itself would take place in the, third, in, the, in the third year, essentially. So Peter, do you have th things to add on this? I was just going to say one thing, the placement is massively successful in the school. Uh, we got over 100 students currently out of placement during COVID. We'll have uh, more every year. So every year we have 100 plus business students going out into placement. They cover a wide range of industries from financial services through to production, uh, you name it, and, and they're in it. So these students in uh, business and global cultures will be part of a well-worn a machine that our great placement office run on placement. So it is a paid work placement. The minimum pays always at least the minimum wage and several are earning, uh, most are earning over the minimum wage. But more than anything, it gives you a really great experience. The, the students come back from the placement, just fundamentally transform people. A lot of them come at the start and they go, geez, you know, uh, what's all this work about? They come back and they study really hard. One of the really interesting data points is that on average, a placement student gets four percentage points final in their final year higher than they did in their second year. That's motivational. That's because they went out and they did the work placement. So it's a wonderful <laughs> opportunity to work placement, so much so that I did it myself my own degree and loved it. Thank you, Peter. Now, I know, Hannah, this degree is very much your brainchild working with colleagues, but Absolutely, your energy was crucial in taking it from, I mean, I think in life, there's people who have ideas and then there's people who deliver. Uh, and so absolutely, in your case, it's a kind of having an idea and then have it and deliver. So maybe talk to us just a little bit about why and, and the, the aspect of the concept that you had and, and uh, your thoughts on it. Thank you so much, John. Yeah, I want. I guess I wanted to add um, something that um, is uh, difficult to, you know, grasp and uh, express uh, in in few words. But um, what this degree gives you on the global culture side is a certain sensitivity to cultural difference. What you know, we are all anthropologists. As what anthropology does, it allows you to see culture where you would normally not see it even in yourself. So when you're Irish, you think this is a way to be. Once you go through this program, you will know it's just one way of being. And the way that other people are is just as human, as being, you know, and, and social and cultural as being, uh, as, being, as being Irish. And so the kind of sensitization that the degree will give you is hard to, you know, it's hard to stress more. So um, for example, I would give you an example um, I, when I arrived in Ireland two years ago, uh, I, my neighbor happens to have a degree from Maynooth in business and anthropology before, of course, this degree in global cultures came, uh, came about. And she always, in our very frequent interactions, stresses how important and useful it was to her work as an aviation consultant. When she is suddenly in an office of 30 people that everybody comes from a different place for her, it's completely natural. And she has had enormous success because she didn't have to overcome those barriers, cultural barriers that, that are an obstacle for other people. So that's what the degree, that's what the degree gives you. That's what is so special about it. It also gives students observational skills. So this, you know, this ability to see culture is also a way to see how people behave. They will learn what we call ethnographic methods, which is basically observing people and learning from it. 
and being able to not go immediately into judgment and solution without actually understanding why the solution. So it's a, it's a qualitative subject that will increase in very fundamental ways the possibility of success on the market for the graduates in the global world. Thank you, Hannah. And can I just say, colleagues, that again, there's the concept whereby a student might be applying for the uh, business and global cultures and may not just get into it because it's going to be like the points were, are relatively high. Uh, there is the option again through MH101 of taking business, any of the business streams with anthropology in first year. And then assuming that you pass outright first year, you'd have the option of getting into second year. And, and don't worry, because our colleague Judah Caffrey has nailed this into the prospectus. And so all of that is there. So you don't have to worry about, yes, it's there for, for students to review and it'll be on the web as well. But those transfer pathways have been outlined in full in the publications. Uh, and then just to reassure you again that, you know, students coming into MH404 will have the full four weeks to decide what combinations would I like? Will I try global cultures for one or two weeks to see, is it for me? And, and so all the combinations and the flexibility is, is, is in there as part of the degree program. So I'm, I'm a little bit conscious of time, uh, but, but obviously questions are the key part of today. And that's why we were keen to take questions and please keep popping, please asking them those questions and, and we'll keep answering them. Uh, but I do want to move on to the new BSc, MH415, which is the BSc in economics, which is an integrated master's in economics. And say thanks to, to Hannah and to David and to Peter and Valerie so far. Uh, so I'll be introducing now uh, Dr. Devana Pastin. Uh, her uh, our geography is moving from Central Europe to Turkey, and uh, Devana has worked. Her PhD is from Georgetown in the US. Uh, she's worked in Turkey and in Canada and uh, is a treasurer here at Manute University, where she manages and, and runs the Department of Economics. And again, it was Devana's idea to have a specialized economics. BSc and MSc, and uh, over to you, Tavana, to explain it to us, the new program. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And John has an economics degree. He is an economist with a PhD, and I think he's going to give us 22 minutes instead of 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I did I did text and said, you weren't going to lose time. I am going to shorten my time, Tavana, to give you your full, full compliment. And over, okay. yes, absolutely. So, Kay, Kay, will you take over? I can take over to Valid Steer, so I'm going to oh, just um, share yes. my screen. Yes, Deirdre has been minding it very carefully for you, Tavana. So can we all see that? Yes. Yes. I just want to make sure with the sound, I'm just going to mute myself and just let me know if you can hear it, because I know there's a few comments about the, the mics being muted. Hi, I'm Tuana Pastin from the Department of Economics, and I'm... Is that, could you hear that or do we need to have the microphone on? Yes, perfect. 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 Okay, brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Let's enjoy. Delighted to introduce to you a new program in economics, BSc Economics. The CAO code is MH415. This program will be of interest to students with an analytical mind and with a passion to tackle pressing economic and socioeconomic challenges such as poverty, financial instability, gender and racial inequality, and climate change. The program will put students on a path to become professional economists. So the program is for students who envision going for a master's after their BSc in economics. Students will learn to take a scientific evidence-based approach to understand economic and socioeconomic problems to critique existing policies and to create new solutions to combat these problems in public and private sector. The program is delivered by the Department of Economics. It's delivered by economists who are experts in their fields with international reputation in excellence in research. We are in top 8% of research institutions worldwide. And the members of the department contribute to Irish policymaking using their expertise in a variety of areas. For instance, Dr. Doris is in the Commission on Pension Funds, and Professor O'Neill is 
in the Labor Market Advisory Council. And it makes a difference to learn economics from people who have the expertise, who are the generators of knowledge, who to, it makes a difference to have the opportunity to read their research papers and to discuss the papers with them in class and to talk about real world applications. The bare bone of the program, BSD Economics, is three years in duration. And there is an Erasmus study abroad option that students can take if they like. That would be after the first two years in Maynooth campus. The Living Cert minimum requirements are in the CAO handbook. Uh, there are two important points to highlight. One is that no prior training in economics is necessary. So Living Cert economics is not a requirement the students do not need to have taken economics before. And the second one is we have a maths minimum requirement, ordinary level one or higher level five or above. So my talk is going to be structured in this way. First, I'm going to show you a video that I had prepared earlier about why uh, study economics. Uh, and then why BSc in economics? Uh, and the BSc economics program is integrated with the MSc um, economics program. And I'm going to talk about what that integration means and why we designed the program in this way. And then I'll talk about alternative paths the students can take. And I'll get a bit, give a bit more information uh, on the program. So let us first go to the link to the video. You might have heard of the scandal that shook Yahoo a while back. The CEO of Yahoo was found to have light in his CV he claimed that he had a computer science degree when he didn't and during the same scandal it came out that one of the directors of the board of directors of yahoo misrepresented herself and said that she studied economics and marketing when she didn't even have enough credits for a minor in economics so you're wondering well, what makes economics such a prestigious subject for this woman to want to have light in her CV about it? Well, economists are perceived as analytically competent people. They have understanding of social issues and the real world. And they are good at communicating ideas. And I would say this is a golden combination. Economics is the study of how to evaluate alternatives, how to make good choices, and not only in business, but also in public policy. It develops critical thinking. It builds technical skills to examine data to support good decisions. Economics is exciting, important, and rewarding. Understanding how markets work, how rules affect equilibrium outcomes, how economic forces derive social systems, equipped economists with skills to solve challenging, pressing economic problems. These skills are desired across a wide range of careers in public and private sectors. Economists work as consultants, fund managers, investment bankers, urban planners, journalists, teachers, and policy makers. Formulating public policy, economists offer evidence-based decision-making with true understanding of incentives. Without these, public policy can have the COBRA effect. And what is the COBRA effect? Well, it comes from a historical anecdote where the British colonial government in India decided to eradicate the venomous snakes. And uh, for that purpose, they offered cash price to each dead cobra that was brought to their offices. And what happened? 
well, the Indian entrepreneurs started cobra farms. So likewise, important public policy decisions, such as deciding on the optimal level of employment benefits, requires an economist. How much should we pay every month to the unemployed so that it keeps families from poverty, but so that it does not reduce the incentive to find a job? Should we have universal basic income scheme? What would be the effects of this in the overall economy? How to improve international cooperation in environmental protection? How do we improve the Irish public health system? What does the future hold for cryptocurrencies? Should we regulate campaign spending to improve the quality of our democracy? This last question is the question that I work on in my research. You can also think of economists as engineers, implementing economic ideas, tailoring recommendations based on the fine details of the problem, how to design a system so that poor people without credit history can receive loans for their startup business. An innovative solution for this was proposed by the economist Mohamed Yunus, which got him the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006. He took economic theory, he took existing economic ideas, and he tailored a solution for the case of Bangladesh. And it turned out to be so successful that it's in very many developing countries at the moment. Economics is not so much about the subject matter. It's about how to think analytically. And it provides a toolbox to take a scientific approach using data. Economists are also in high demand in private sector. Firms need economists to analyze the market, not only the consumer behavior, where there's a lot of data nowadays, but also the potential competitor behavior. Before making choices about the product line, about marketing, and about pricing. Economists are also needed to design the best incentive system to motivate the employees for the needs of a particular company. Economists are trained to see the big picture. They realize decisions do not only have an immediate effect, but effects propagate and create feedback effects. An analysis of Standard Poor's 500 CEOs, so these are the 500 top publicly traded companies in the stock market in US, shows that economics majors are more likely to become a CEO than any other major. A key indicator of the value of an economics major is long-term success and lifetime earnings. On average, economics degree holders are very well paid compared to nearly every other field. The lifetime earnings of economics majors outpace other business majors social science majors, and engineering majors. A report from US documents substantial wage growth over the first 10 years of work life, almost doubling the entry rate. And this one is from Irish sources. Here are the sources of some statistics I mentioned during my talk. Please visit the website of the Department of Economics. The website is rich with videos on game theory, on minimum wage, and taster videos of a variety of economics modules. Okay, so why BSc in economics? Students can study economics also through MH101, uh, through BA Arts, but we also are starting this designated program, uh, will, which will take students in next September. Now, the needs of the Irish labor market is changing very rapidly. And we asked our board of advisors to give us guidance about the landscape of the labor market. And members of the advisory board uh, of our department are in top ranks of these institutions such as Central Bank and Central Statistics Office. And they follow the labor market trends very closely. And the uniform view 
of the advisory board is that in all sectors, public and private, from financial services to agriculture, firms, institutions need people with solid understanding in economics and be able to analyze and interpret data. This requires significant quantitative education beyond the economics core in BA Arts. In addition to core economics modules from the first year onwards, the BSc students will train in technical skills, in statistics, in econometrics and programming. These are required to critically analyze and interpret economic data. The BSc economics program is integrated with MSc economics program. We designed it to be integrated. So the default path for a student is to come into BSc economics and to automatically uh, progress to MSc economics as long as they reach the minimum standard. Before I give further information about the integrated nature of the program, let us uh, first go to a video that uh, my colleague Edin Doris made and uh, she'll talk about the merits of doing a master's degree. Okay, here is the link. With any master's programme, the main advantage is that um, uh, it pushes you up uh, into a higher entry level when you're going into a programme, when you're going into a job. Um, and once you're in at that higher level, you advance more quickly. So you're on a steeper career path. And that's particularly true for economics um, and, and, um, and financial services jobs. So, for example, so there isn't great data available for Ireland, but we know that for the UK, somebody with a master's degree, a, ma a guy with a master's degree, gets a, a nearly 9% increase in annual earnings. And for a woman, that's nearly 19%. So these are really big, you know, over, you know, your whole career, that adds up to a, a big benefit of doing a, doing a master's in, in the kind of economics discipline. So that's one thing. It's not just about money, though. It's also that you 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 get to do more interesting work. So, you know, in a lot of graduate jobs, you go in and there's kind of an element of doing a bit of drudge work for a year or two at the beginning of the job. That's you you you, you skip through that faster. So that makes it more interesting. Um, and then, of course, there are some jobs that you just can't do without a master. So particularly a lot of our graduates become professional economists. If you want to be a professional economist, you need a master's. You can't go in as a professional economist otherwise. And there are loads of jobs available for professional economists in Ireland, not least because the civil service is ramping up its demand for, for economists within the civil service. And actually, they find it really hard to get enough qualified people for those jobs. So. You know, they're they're both the, the the benefits are both financial and in terms of the the kind of job you can do. BSc economic students will be treated as MSc students in training, and they will have an economic academic mentor from day one. The quota of the program is twenty students, so it's a small program, and we will give the students the individual attention that they deserve. So uh, the program will uh, put emphasis on independent research. Each year, there is an independent research component of the program. Um, in the second year, the research project will be a team project. And in the final year, the research project will be a BSc thesis. And it will be a full year thesis. It will be worth two modules, two five credit modules. So it will be a substantial piece of thesis. And students will flourish based on individual curiosity and their individual strengths. <clears throat> In the third year, students will be given guidance for the BSc thesis jointly with the MSc students on research and presentation skills. This will allow smooth progression from MSc from BSc economics to MSc economics uh, not only in technical skills but also in research culture so as i mentioned the default path is that a BSc student continues automatically to the MSc economics some students might choose 
to do only the BSc economics degree and they might then go to private or public sector jobs or they can do a master's in business, international development, data science. So they will be ready for uh, technical masters such as data science as well. And we have the Erasmus study uh, abroad option uh, and uh, we're also working on a placement. Uh, we're talking about um, internships with um, one of the banks, one of the international banks here, but it's a little too early to announce. Okay, so we are taking an interdisciplinary approach in this program. Uh, in the first year, in addition to the economics modules, students will be able to choose from a variety of disciplines such as sociology, philosophy, computer science. And in the second and third year, they will be able to continue to take some optional modules from other disciplines than economics. And we believe that these are going to create synergies in their research and they will broaden students' horizon. It turns out somebody who is good at sociology is also good at economics and somebody who is good in computer science is going to have easy time in their research. And students can also take German or Spanish in the first year, which will be of benefits if they choose to go uh, abroad in the third year of their studies. An alternative plan would be, or an alternative path, I should say, not the plan, uh, would be in the second year, if student decides that they actually enjoyed, um, say, geography more than economics. In that case, they can switch to MH 101 and they can uh, have the major in geography and uh, keep economics as a minor if they wish. In year one, the BSc students will be assigned an academic family with an MSc student and a member of our postgrad economics alumni. So students will stay with the same alumni mentors until graduation. And by the time they graduate, they will have a connection to an alumni network member in a senior position and to three other recent graduates in their early stages of their careers. The guidance of postgraduate alumni mentors is very valuable. Uh, there are many um, mentors in influential positions in important public and private sector uh, firms and institutions. Well, the department is devoted to giving top quality education. On top of traditional lectures, supervision, advisory roles, members of the department arrange career talks for the students and talks from economists who influence public policy. So this is a list of the uh, student seminars that we had. And this year we're going to have, uh, that we had last year, and this year we're going to have workshops. Uh, on uh, GIS, uh, Geographic Information Systems for Economists, and uh, the other workshop will be on Big Data and Machine Learning. So these workshops are not modules, they are not uh, for credit, they don't have a final examination, they are completely on a volunteer basis, and they are open to any economic students who are interested in learning new skills, but at the end of it, the, the department will give a certificate saying that the student has attended the workshop. Um, when students tell me that uh, they cannot make their mind on whether to study economics or not, I recommend them two books. And uh, these books are great to show uh, that Economics is not about subject matter, but how to think analytically. So, for instance, if economics is talking about match fixing in professional sumo, parental influence on children's life outcomes, legalization of abortion and its effects on crime rates. 
The game theory book, game theory is about strategic interaction, talks about stock market crashes, talks about the economic perspective of social norms and how they develop. Um, the game theory book uh, takes the readers on a journey, uh, covers about 10 Nobel Prize winning ideas in a very intuitive manner. It's very easy and fun read. If you can email this address by the end of today, you can enter a draw to win one of the books. I will have the department to send three copies of Freakonomics and I will send three copies of Game Theory book myself. Um, and I'm sure that uh, you will enjoy them and uh, you might want to share them with your students. Thank you very much. I hope you sent students to us you can be absolutely sure that they are going to be in very good hands. Thank you very much, Tavana. Um, and that was riveting. Uh, as you know, I have an interest in economics, but I have an interest, I, I'm a bit like a hurler on the ditch. I have to, and I do have an interest in all the disciplines here at the university, but I suppose in fairness, economics teaches us a lot. Um, can I ask, we had a question to Vanna, and it was about the person asking around the master's. Just the question was, how long is the master's? And maybe just Lee, maybe mention that, uh, how, how it's structured and maybe the length of the master's. I think I didn't mention it in my presentation. It's one full year. So it okay. starts in September and it ends at the end of August. And it's an existing program. It went through test of time. Um, the summer goes to uh, a master's thesis. That's excellent. Okay, I'm not sure if there was other questions for Giovanna, um, but just in case. No, that yeah. was it. It was just about the whole area of the master's and how it would actually work. Um, we had one there, so it's four years, including the master's. So that is just exactly what you have addressed there. Thank you. Yes, or, or five, if you also go to Erasmus options. Of course, of course, yeah. absolutely. And uh, once again, as the QQI uh, links into this particular degree as well, John, I know you keep Thank answering you. that question, um, yeah, but yeah. it comes so, up every now, every, every presentation, it is coming up. So thank you for that. And so we have the QQI links for the other programs that we're announcing and launching this afternoon. In the case of economics, it's one of these things we allowed that particular degree because of the 01, H5 and maths a year just to see how that everything is okay. So it's something that we keep in review on the QQI. So it's certainly there for the other programs, but but not this particular one for 2022, but it's something we, we keep in review. Terrific. And last one there is just on the masters about the cost of it, as somebody's interested in terms of how it would work out for costing for students. Thank you. Uh, so obviously the student who's on a grant will be funded by the uh, SUSE grant for the BSE, and then that grant would continue for the masters if they're eligible. If you're not eligible, then you would actually have to pay the tuition fee, which is typically about 5,000 euro to Vanna, but I, you, you might know the exact figure for the cost of the uh, MSc in economics. It should be about that, John. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we do we do come up with uh, scholarships for uh, MSc students as well, but uh, I guess you can't uh, count on that when you're starting uh, with the program. Yeah, Correct. so... Yeah. yeah, no, obviously it is an investment in your education, or every education is an investment in your edu education, but from our colleague, Dr. Aideen Doris is showing the actual income stream that arises from further credentials in your life. So well worth doing and you would get it most back in, in time. Definitely, well worth it, yes. Yeah. Thanks to Vanna. And um, so, so again, excited about that program. It's MH415. Uh, the key thing would be the requirements of the uh, 01 H5 in mathematics, uh, but a language is not required, but you do have to have a pass in Irish and English or an exemption in, in Irish. And importantly, a student would not have to have economics to, to study that program. So, okay, I'm just conscious of time. So I think we'll, we'll quickly run through my own slides and then go to the open forum, if that's okay. Yes, that's absolutely fine, John. Thank you. So I hope that's coming up okay there, Kay. Yes, it is indeed. So if you just go into present mode there, you should be fine. Thank you. So again, if you enter there, correct. 
Exactly. How about now, that? that that's, okay? that's looking a lot always, better now. Thank you. There's always nervous moments because you're never too sure will it actually come up. Yes. Uh, so listen, again, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, just to say that I'd be very brief just to mention the academic changes, some physical changes, some other updates and events, and then back to the panel discussion toward, towards the end. Um, just, just importantly, a set of changes. I know our colleague Professor Heffernan mentioned about Chinese being a 30 credit version from 2022. So it's currently 15 for the first years joining us this year, but that is moving to a 30 credit beginner from 2022. The other thing just to say is we're introducing accounting and music. Uh, so in arts, they're available both as a 15 credit version, but also 30 credits. And students have the four week decide, decision period to allow them to do that. Just on through uh, Carter Change, Mas Mian La Gwilaga Yenov, Idrigus Kim and Idrigus Bunskala. So if you wanted to do the primary education through the Gaeltuck route, it's changing from a Grada Hitcher to a Grada Hitcher 3 from 2022. So if you wanted to take the uh, program, you'd actually have to um, have a H3 in Ireland. Just to mention that Greek and Latin are no longer available as separate subjects, but will be available through the Greek and Roman civilizations. Uh, the other thing is the QQI links we've mentioned already, and then new elective streams are also available this year. We're introducing new critical streams, new elective streams all, all the time. Uh, just moving on to new physical developments here on the campus, uh, the new academic building, the 57 million building we're really excited about, coming to us in November in the first phase, second phase is next April. And thank you very much. I know Beatrice was in touch earlier on. Thank you, the president of the IGC, Beatrice Dooley. Uh, and in, in a way, I think we're expecting five to 600 delegates here from the Institute of Guidance Councils for your national conference here. And it's coordinated with the Kildare branch of the IGC. And, and that's happening here in, uh, next April. So it's basically a, a fantastic opportunity to meet you all. Uh, we're also introducing and the building, building has started a new student center that will be happening uh, from January 2023. Just very briefly, I know we had a lot of questions coming in around schools liaison exhibitions. Just to say the dollar that is happening uh, mainly online currently, but increasingly there is a uh, move, and I think later in the semester, to actual physical uh, in school visits and, and physical uh, exhibitions. Uh, one to mention one of our colleagues in the team retired this year, Margaret Madden, who's a, a long serving colleague of the university and uh, Fanula Finnegan, who worked over many years with, with Margaret, has taken up that role and will be coordinating the university's exhibition program. Uh, publications will be going out to you next week. Judah Caffrey has finished off on all of those and they'll be going out on the new website will be up in the next uh, uh, week. We've actually updated those and, and they'll be there in the next week or so. Uh, we have a new portal, I'll show you that in a moment, in terms of MU chat. And then we'll be having a weekly webinar as well in terms of uh, Q&A. And, and, and each week on a Wednesday, there'll be opportunities to come on to the programmes here to, to have a look at that. Uh, and MU Live that we created last year is one of our innovations. We're very pleased with it, and that'll be happening again each, each Wednesday evening. It could be different topics and different teams each week. Uh, and there'll be more on that on our website, and we'll be communicating with you about that. Uh, just finally, we've been working significantly on the transport connections here. Uh, there's a new air coach uh, service coming from Galway, Ballinasloe, Athlone to Maynooth and from to Dublin Airport. Our, our Wexford Wicklow students are now catered for because we have a new daily route. Uh, I was talking to Amy Pettit this morning just to finalise all of that. So that's available uh, last year and will be commencing this year. Um, and then the continuation of our Tipperary and water ser Waterford services as well as the connection to Carter Cross, which is a new arrangement there. So a range of transport connections. Maynooth is accessible, increasingly accessible through those commuter pathways. Um, I mentioned about the peer uh, chat facility. Uh, our colleague Emma Shine in the office manages it. And uh, it's a fantastic opportunity. So you could just mention for our students, to your students, the capacity to talk to our students uh, via the Unibody chat framework. Uh, and our student ambassadors are fantastic in terms of connecting in with if they have any questions at all. There was a number of questions about grade inflations and points and looking forward to 2022. And what I did was just chart up the, the Leaving Cert uh, distribution from 2019. 
uh, and also then 2020, and then also 2021. And if we have a look on the right hand side is the orange from 2019 and 2020. And if we look at it again, you can see here on the gray hands, gray bars on the right hand side, the, the number of people increasingly so getting more than 500 points this year and more than 600 points. And that has really fed into the uh, changes. And people were asking then about 2022, what's 2022 gonna look like? Very hard for us to know, but you can imagine if you're in the State Exams Commission and are managing the exams process, you, there's different scenarios here. There's a 2019, 2020, 2021. So three different sets of results in terms of the distribution. And I'm actually not sure what 2022 will look like, but you can see it has significantly changed over the, the recent years. And um, just to wrap up then in terms of events, we have been asked about physical events here on campus or virtual events. Our, our sense is across the system, across higher education, I think that many of the open days will possibly be virtual uh, in semester one up until Christmas. We're, we're not definitive about that. We, we just don't know. Um, we'd be more hopeful, I think, in April and in June in terms of our spring open day and our, our summer open day. Um, but we actually don't know. And, and we'll be in touch with you probably in the next few weeks in relation to our, our November open days and the structures of those. I think, thank you very much, Beatrice Dooley. Thank you for your attendance this afternoon, the president of the GIC, and warm wishes because in fairness, we're working really closely, as we were saying, with the IGC in terms of the national conference here. And we're very delighted to have that relationship with the IGC and the conference to be taking place here on the campus uh, next April. Hopefully, people will be dying to, to get a good sense of, of an actual physical, physical experience. And, and uh, actually, uh, I know there's going to be a blended model in terms of, but a significant number of, of the delegates will be here on, on campus. And then finally, just to summer school, our colleague, Dr. Laura Creevy looks after that. And that will be hopefully taking place here again on campus next June. So a whole range of events happening over the coming year, and we'll be in contact with you about those. Um, so we'll kind of move over now to the Q&A forum. We'll come back as panelists. We'll take any questions. I'm conscious we have run over by, by 10 minutes, uh, but crucially, if you can stay with us, you'd be more than welcome to, and we'll be happy to take any questions that you may have for us at this stage. So that's it, Kay. I don't know if there's any other questions that you want there's to There's nothing visible to me. Um, we have addressed, there's just a thank you there to Dr. Heffernan for an answer that she, um, Professor Heffernan for a, an answer that she gave earlier on to Valerie. And um, just uh, from the president of the IGC sending us good wishes. So thank you for that. Um, so no, there's, it doesn't seem to be anything okay. else in there at the moment. Yeah, Ita, if you're available, could you just mention around the available places for engineering and the maths, you know, maybe just to, and, and maybe the whole, uh, I didn't get an opportunity to introduce Ita earlier on, our University Science and Engineering Promotion Officer. So over to you, Ita. Thanks a million, John, and um, I'm very well informed about everything economics, and I was very excited when I heard um, such a correspondence to engineers, because as many people know, I'm passionate about engineering and science. And uh, thank you for the introduction, John. And just to let um, guidance counsellors know out there, if you have any budding um, engineers who possibly applied through the CEO and maybe didn't get the course that they're offering or hadn't considered um, choosing engineering at Maynooth University, we just want to use this opportunity to let you know about the available places if your students have a higher four in higher level maths and additional entry requirements. My email address is eta.mcguigan at nu.ie if you need any further information this afternoon, this evening, or any stage throughout the week. In addition, I'm delighted to offer, um, as I say, I'm passionate about STEM, so I'd be delighted to either visit your school or give you a virtual talk to your students about the wonderful STEM opportunities are presented by studying um, STEM at Maynooth University. Um, and I, again, please feel to uh, drop me an email. I think that's me, John. Apologies about taking up any more time, but I um, just want to let you know about those um, opportunities that might be of benefit to you and your students. And thank you. Thanks, Ida. Sheila, I, I would have expected some here and there questions coming in. I know we work together very carefully with the here and there did you want to just say a few, couple of words just around the whole aspect of the management of that and how important it is to us? Yeah, absolutely, John. Thank you. 
Um, so I'm sure all our guidance counsellors know that here and there are very important student intake um, in, our, in our first year, and we offer some great supports through, through the Access Office. So in the run-up to round one in particular, we are going through lists and lists of all the eligible students who've qualified for here, who've qualified for DARE, and trying our best, I suppose, to, to following the rules, but to fit them in and to give them their places. Un unfortunately, there, there, there is a cap of 5% in each class on here candidates and on DARE candidates. But um, we're, we're very confident we, we were as generous as we could be this year and have offered out uh, as many here and DARE places as, as possible. But if any queries in relation to here and DARE at Maynooth, please don't hesitate to come directly to me at sheila.persil at mu.ie or indeed um, send your students uh, with, with queries as well. Thanks, Sheila. I know, would you also just mention that QQI and the, the scale of it, just because sometimes people feel, I know we mentioned a few numbers earlier this afternoon, but just the sense that we have it almost in every programme, would not be fair to say that QQI linkage? There's very few courses that we don't have yeah. the, the, the QQI link, um, the, the pure psychology degree and, and primary teaching uh, just spring, spring to mind. But, I suppose in some courses, we'd implore you to be realistic. There is, if it's a really highly competitive course for, for points, for leading to points, it's also, if there is a QQI entry route, it will still be also really, really competitive. So in some of our courses, for example, um, the law degree, um, Actually, I've just realized I made a mistake there about psychology earlier. <laughs> okay. Or we do have the new psychology That's entry okay. routes. Um, psychology and law um, are, are so competitive. Not everybody, even with the full range of eight distinctions in the right course, still do not get an offer. It has to go to random selection. And, and that can be really harsh. So just to remember, um, your QQI student said if it's competitive in the Leaving Cert pool, it's also competitive in QQI. And, and it's all about supply and demand again. Um, so sorry, Absolutely. apologies. Psychology does does definitely have QQI entry route, but very very competitive, um, and, and just opened in the last year or two. Thanks, Sheila. And you now some some students obviously then put MH one hundred and one and apply and do psychological studies, and so there's some sort of back out, and the same with law. But uh, as Sheila says, it, it can be very competitive on the psychology and and uh, and law programs. I'm conscious, Fanula. Did you want to say a few words just around the weekly Wednesday? approach and the experience of the learning that we had last year and what our ambition is for this year. Yeah. Absolutely. Sorry, I almost uh, got rid of myself there from the screen. Um, yes, last year was tricky initially because in the absence of career events, we weren't really sh too sure how to progress, but we had a very successful year with the creation of MU Live. So we endeavoured to bring uh, initially, we brought three live events into classrooms and into people's homes um, every week. And we did that up until May of last year. So we managed to reach about 1,070 students, I think, if I'm not mistaken, who, who, who threw the program. So it was great. We, we focused on all aspects of Maynooth University life, from the overview of the courses to the arts degree, to mature students, to QQI, to sports scholars, et cetera. And we even reached out to departments and got them involved as well. So this year, I suppose uh, the landscape has changed quite rapidly. We started off thinking it would probably be all virtual. And now we have uh, received in-person and on-site requests as well. So we probably won't be as ambitious as we were last year with MU Live, but we will still offer weekly webinars on a Wednesday evening. Um, we found with a bit of feedback that probably the evening time does reach the most amount of people after work and after commute and organizing families, et cetera. So we'll still be beaming into homes then and reaching out and talking about all various aspects of Maynooth University life and courses and departments in Scatra. Thank you, Fanula, for that. I, I'm just conscious, Laura, the summer school is something that we're very keen to start off. And maybe would you just mention the summer school, but, but more importantly, right now in terms of school visits and maybe speak for yourself and Kay in terms of if I'm a guidance counsellor and I have an interest in getting the Maynooth University, if I'm interested in these new programmes and having somebody from the university in to speak about the new programmes, how, how would they go about that? Absolutely, yeah. So um, 
you, if you're interested in having us visit, uh, be it virtually or in person, absolutely please drop us an email. They can come in to myself, uh, laura.creed.mu.e or k, k.mitchell.mu.e or a lot obviously can come through the general admissions email. And um, we're very keen to visit, very keen to talk to people. And again, it was a different kind of year last year with the way we um, operated, but we got to, again, speak to a lot of people and we still had that relationship. So we're very keen to make sure that we kind of grow on that again um, this year. Thanks, Laura. And I'm conscious, Judith, uh, would you mention just because there's a significant amount of material being dispatched in the next week to 10 days, would you just explain to colleagues what how all of that's going to happen? Yeah. Not by my fair hands, anyhow. Um, but yeah, we have our, our colleagues in uh, Centra who are based in Glasnevin, so they'll be doing our fulfilment again this year. We um, sent to print on Monday, and it'll take about a week to ten days for it to be uh, to come to, to actual fruition. But we'll be posting them out then, as I say, via our colleagues in Centra from hopefully about two weeks' time, and we'll land in school. So if you have any particular requests in terms of numbers please email me and I can uh, amend our file to suit. Okay. Thank you. And Deirdre, just finally, I, I am conscious there's some adult guidance counsellors and people would be working with mature students applying to the university. And that's something that you had a lot of expertise in during the year. So I don't know if you briefly wanted to mention, you know, if people were working with a mature student applying to Maynooth, how do we go from hero, zero to hero? Um, and I know that's a tricky question, but maybe just a little bit about how we manage the mature process. Yes, it's very important to apply through the CAO and um, that they are aware of their dates that they apply beforehand for their interviews. You know, some courses require interviews, some require tests. So as well to check out the mature handbook that I'm sure uh, is on the website as well. And to make sure you're aware of which requirements are required for the course of entry and preferred course of entry for the mature student. Thanks, Deirdre. And um, I'm conscious we, we're going to wrap up and apologies for our overrun. Uh, I take full responsibility as I'm a very poor convener. All the credit goes to Kay Mitchell and Deirdre de Carroll um, and our guest speakers and colleagues across the team. Um, I'm just conscious I'm about to get, I'm sure, a slap on the wrist about something that I haven't done. Can I just check in with you, Kay? Is there something that I've missed? I'm sure I've done something. Um, well, you did glance over it, but I suppose, and this is a general question, it's not for any particular um, uh, academic or anything like that, is to do with the issue around grade inflation, which we're all very aware of. And yes. that was a concern that has been expressed in the in the um, in initial registration form. Most of the other issues that we had addressed in there are uh, that you know were addressed to us rather. Uh, we have covered more or less uh, as the as the presentations have gone through. Yeah. No. I to be honest, I was asked by a journalist recently, "Is the CEO dead? Do we scrap the CEO and start again?" And my response was. Um, Whenever you can figure out how you can fit 85,000 applicants into 50,000 places, uh, come back and talk to me, I said to them, uh, because the CEO does try to take 85,000 people and give them out fairly to the 50,000. Uh, now, obviously, this year was particularly difficult because there was a significant amount of people who missed out on random selection. I'm very pleased to say here at Manute University, we worked very hard so that students wouldn't be on star with on random selection and we managed to make sure that all of our offers and all of our courses there was nobody on random selection i think it's and i i had i had i'm conscious that we are being recorded but it's probably a little bit untenable to have another year in 2022 with a significant amount of people again on random selection so i think there might be some movement back either to a 2021 scenario of a distribution where there wasn't that random selection uh, sorry 2020 scenario apologies from 2021 back to a 2020, something on that on a par, moving towards 2019, but on a gradual basis. But but genuinely, I you know, crystal ball gazing, we don't, we don't know. But I, I think that's the, the, the thing, Kay, I, I don't know if we would be able to see if it's possible again to have another set of grades that are higher. In fact, there was so many problems this year whereby people got the maximum and still didn't get a place. So hopefully uh, there, there'll be some uh movement backwards next year would be my my thoughts on it yes okay um so i think we'll, we'll finish up I, i'm conscious 
Deirdre, you have a video to show delegates who will be coming to a new university or a new academic building. And we're just going to play out with that video, if that's OK. Uh, we're delighted that you were able to join us this afternoon. Everything that we had dealt with and uh, has been recorded and is available to you. For your students, all of the material and course finder and perspectives and everything on the web is available and they can connect in and ask for perspectives and all of that. And everything is on the web. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon and uh, go safely and all the best. Bye bye. So that's it, John. Uh, we've come to the end of the session. So I think people are departing.